The teachers' strike ends and vulnerable Democrats shun President Biden. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. Technically, the Columbus teachers' strike does not end until the union ratifies the tentative agreement, but it appears the labor dispute has ended. That is good news for students and parents because classroom learning would begin on Monday. The conceptual agreement came very early Thursday morning after a 12-hour bargaining session on the first day of school. As of Friday afternoon, the school board and the union have refused to release details of the contract, so we don't know what size pay raises teachers will get and how the contract addresses things like air conditioning systems, art and music programs, as well as class sizes. Derek Clay, it's really hard since we don't know the details, but what does your gut tell you? Who won in these negotiations? Well, I can tell you who lost is the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids lost in this. There's an old uh, African proverb that when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And in this instance, it's the kids that's suffering. Um, we won't know what's in this uh, new deal until it's ratified, and hopefully it'll get ratified tonight. But I can tell you that the way it is sounding through the media, it yeah. sounds like the teachers prevailed on this one. Bob Clay, would you agree that uh, a quick settlement after they, that I think the school board perhaps didn't really believe the teachers would go on strike? They did. And they, but they settled the first day. Yeah, I mean, I got to agree with Derek that, uh, you know, I think the teachers probably will make out OK. I don't know if they're going to get everything that they want. Um, I was a little surprised that it came to a strike because when you look at all the disruptions we've had because of COVID and all the school days that were missed, um, you know, I'm always concerned when both the school board and the teachers keep saying the kids are our top priority. Well, were they really the top priority here? I, I question whether they really took into account, you know, having kids once again missing days of school. Yeah, I had predicted on this show that they would reach a deal before the beginning of school because of that reason, because of all the disruption that the parents were going to be mad. And, and Joe, that first day was rough. All first days are rough anyway. They are. No matter, back from the beginning of time. Um, but yeah. the portal didn't work. They couldn't get online. A lot of parents showed solidarity. They kept their kids home virtually? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I saw one of the parents interviewed, uh, I think out on the west side, and they asked this parent about that first day, and and she said, you know, I'm just tired. She goes, I'm on strike too. And I <laughs> sat there and I thought, that's every parent in the school district, right? But I think, you know, they're all, you know, just kind of um, frustrated. The parents are frustrated. You know, everyone's frustrated right now. Yeah. And I think maybe that that played into the strike, too, because people were tired of conditions. Sure. Derek, as a communications professional, I've been watching the strategy of this and the union was stressing HVAC systems, smaller class sizes, gym teaching, right. P, uh, arts, music. They didn't want to talk about pay raises. Right. That was intentional, I'm guessing. <laughs> Of course it was intentional. I mean, people can relate to building conditions. People can relate to smaller class sizes. But when you start talking about more money, you know, anytime you want more money when you're advocating for your job, you're not going in and say, hey, I want more money. You're, you start talking about th the intangibles first and then ease into the pay raise. So I think that that strategy was used with the, with the, uh, the school district and the school board. And it uh, looks like they might have prevailed on this one. Uh, Bob, this, those are the things that touch students. Yeah. HVL, two classes that are too hot, too cold. Yeah. You know, buildings, in, buildings in poor repair, yeah. class sizes. Yeah. There's too many kids in my kid's fifth grade class. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, they were smart to do that, but the problem they get is when, you know, when it does come out public, which I'm amazed they can keep this secret when they're dealing with taxpayer dollars, but somehow they are. But once it becomes public, they know a lot of these parents um, of these kids make a lot less than what these teachers make. And uh, they understand that there's a problem there just PR wise of, of if they were talking about, well, we're not making enough money. When a lot of parents are gonna look at that, a lot of taxpayers are gonna look at that and say, wait a second, that looks like a pretty good salary to me. And they want more money, so. Perhaps that's why, they, um, part of the reason, certainly why they scrapped the plans to put a school levy on the November ballot. I think that might very well be, but we've got to see, you know, the details when it comes out. 
Bob, organized labor has taken a lot of hits over the past several decades, but the teachers seem to be pretty, we don't know yet, but it, they seem to be very energized, mobilized, had a lot of public support, a lot of business support. We've seen unions pop up at Starbucks and at Amazon. Is organized labor seeing a little rebirth here, a little more energy lately? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, we had a period of time, like, let's say over the last 40 years, mm -hmm. where the private sector has gone down, public sector went up. For unions. For unions, yeah. yes, union membership. Um, I think that's changing a little bit now because we're seeing, I think, more activity really on the private sector side. And that's more, I think, this new economy that we're in, which is more virtual, more, um, you know, internet connected. And that's why you're seeing like Amazon and, and Starbucks. What's interesting about that is we have these companies that spout very uh, woke or very liberal lines of, 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 of speech, but then when it gets down to their own company, like Starbucks, and they're starting to unionize, it's funny how a lot of those unionized stores are starting to get closed down now. Now, they're claiming in some instances that it's, oh, it's not about that, it's about the safety uh, in the area that the stores are in. Maybe, maybe not, but I think we're starting to see, yeah, unions are a great idea until it's really affecting your own company. Derek, there is a teacher shortage, so a supply and demand, if there's a f short supply of teachers, that's going to give them more leverage, plus sure. the union. Do you, do you think those two things are here to stay? Do you think the unions will take advantage of that and, and get more for their workers? Unions will definitely take advantage of that, but COVID really changed the game for everybody mm -hmm. because when everybody was forced into a virtual situation where they had to work from home and uh, they saw that it could work, now folks are, are you know, to, to, to Joe's point, uh, it's, um, it, it makes it easier when you can have a work-life balance. And I think that that's really what this is about, work-life mm -hmm. balance. Joe, do you see the school department, there was a lot of calls during this dispute to change how the school department operates. Fewer administrators, more money for the classroom, more money for building maintenance. Do you see this as a point where the school district might change the way it operates or is it just get through this and forget about it move on to the next one? Oh, who knows? I, I can't even guess what the school district's going to do. I, every time I think it's going to do something, it does something different. So. Mike, I think the only way the school district will change is if they do put a levy on the ballot. And I heard that they're going to do it next year. Uh, if it goes on the ballot and it goes down and when they're then forced to cut and make changes, I think they finally will. But I don't think they will until they're forced to. All right. First, Tim Ryan started running away from the left wing of the Democratic Party. He said he agrees with Trump and not Obama on trade in one ad. In another ad, he strings together Fox News hosts touting him. Now, another longtime Democratic member of Congress is following that strategy. Joe Biden's letting Ohio solar manufacturers be undercut by China. But Marcy Kaptur's fighting back, working with Republican Rob Portman, protecting our jobs. Communist China's not happy. Neither's extremist J.R. Majewski. He opposes Marcy's all of the above energy plan. Majewski let Ohio energy jobs die. But Marcy fights for every Ohio job. Marcy Kaptur, she doesn't work for Joe Biden. She works for you. I'm Marcy Kaptur and I approve this message. Derek Clayton, uh, the Toledo native, faces a tougher re-election fight uh, this cycle. Her new district is much more competitive than her current district, which snakes along Lake Erie from Toledo to Cleveland. Captor faces Republican J.R. Majewski in that November election. Derek Clay, does a, does a partisan, a truly partisan candidate, lifelong Democrat, she's been in office since 1982, right. does she risk anything by really stiff-arming the president of her own party? She has to do that. She has to do that right now because the way that district is written uh, or drawn, yeah. there's a considerable amount of Republicans in that district. And this is a Trump-backed uh, candidate that she's running against. So she has to speak to the moderates that could potentially uh, pick up some votes for her. Mm -hmm. She's going she's gonna to be fine with her Democrats. She's going to be fine in the city of Toledo. But... This is one of those races where she has to go out and talk a little bit more conservative. Bob Clegg, J.R. Majewski is a Marjorie Taylor Greene type candidate. Yeah. He is way out there. A lot of Republicans yeah. after he won in a surprise in yeah. the primary thought, OK, this is over. Marjorie yeah. Kaptur wins this. It's obviously close. She's running an ad. 
indicating that it's close. Yeah, well, she's running an ad in a, in a state where President Biden has an approval rating in the upper 20s. So, I mean, it's called political survival. I find it hilarious that she's running ads against Joe Biden. I find it hilarious that Tim Ryan is the Trump endorsed candidate if you watched his ads. Um, but you know what? I think about it. Uh, Trump won uh, Ohio not once but twice by eight points, the biggest margin since 1988. So um, I think they have to do it. But I think it's ridiculous when you look at both of them and you look at the way they voted in Congress the last two years, 99 percent of uh, agreement with Joe Biden and his policies. But Joe, Marcy Kaptur is basically running in a new district. So there are yeah. probably a lot of voters there who don't know who she is. Folks like us know who people are because we're, yeah. we're political junkies. But she's basically reintroducing herself or introducing herself for the first time to these voters. She is. And you got to remember that J.R. Majewski is doing the same thing. Um, the difference is that Marcy Kaptur has a long history that you can look at and, and you can see where she stood on various issues. So anyone who, who wants to find out if she really does stand with Joe Biden, just go look at, you know, how, has she sided with President Biden on his major issues? The thing is that I'm not convinced that Joe Biden is bad in all cases for her because with the Democrats up there, there are some things happening right now, some Democratic proposals being passed, and they're looking at those things thinking, oh, this is really good, and if they go look at her record and she's standing with Joe Biden, that's not a, that's not a negative thing. So Now, J.R. Majewski could run negative ads pointing out Marcy Kaptur's voting record, but he doesn't probably have a whole lot of money. Do, 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 does the Republican National Committee pump a lot of money into his campaign, given the, his participation in the January 6th uh, Capitol Hill riot? He didn't get charged at all up there, but he, he was there. Well, it depends on what the poll says. I mean, if the poll is close, you're going to see a whole bunch of money dumped into that race, right? <laughs> but if it's not close, then they will not waste time on that race. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you this much. Marcy Kaptur has always been a steadfast advocate for Northwest Ohio, not just the city of Toledo, but for all of North, Northwest and Northeast Ohio. Joe Biden, the, the date's been announced early September, the groundbreaking for the Intel plant in yeah. New Albany. He's going to be there. Mm -hmm. Mike DeWine will be there. Yeah. Who else is going to be there, Bob? Gosh, I think a lot of people are going to be there. Uh, it'll pictures. be interesting. Yeah. It'll be interesting because I'm wondering if you know, does Tim Ryan come? Yeah. Does Nan Whaley come? I, you know, um, I don't think Tim Ryan will. I think he is just so worried about Joe Biden being so radioactive here in Ohio that he's just going to stay as far away as he can. He's never going to mention him. Um, I don't think it's going to work for him. I, I mean, I think in the end, it's just going to be too much. He's not going to be able to prevail. You know, I kind of think maybe maybe Tim Ryan might. And the reason I'm saying that, you know, I think they'll all be there is they were when it was announced. If you looked at, at January when this was announced, you saw the Republicans, Democrats, anyone that thought they could, you know, get some kind of credit for it, they were there. Because in the end, this produces jobs. Mm -hmm. It's a huge deal. And it's all about American manufacturing and making right. those semi uh, semi computer things here at home. I can't the, the chips, 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 right. and uh, you're making them here at home. So I think that's something that plays well, and it plays along with what Tim Ryan's been saving on the yeah. campaign trail. But he'll get his picture taken shaking hands with Joe Biden. That'll be used in ads. Is that worth the, <laughs> you know, the trade-off? I don't know if he's going to take a picture with Joe Biden at yeah. this event, but this is this event is really not about Joe Biden. Yeah. Yeah. It's about the people of Ohio and in uh, this state winning economically. That's what this is about. So I think that you will see Tim Ryan there, and I think that uh, he will utilize that to catapult his his uh, message of you know taking care of the of the Ohio worker because he is the America First candidate. Until <laughs> <laughs> he's not. <laughs> All right. Our next topic: one issue on which centrist Democrats differ with their president is student debt forgiveness. President Biden's order to forgive up to $20,000 in college debt likely pleased the 1.8 million Ohioans who have school loans. It angered others who feel it favors only those who go to college. Tim Ryan said waiving student debt sends the wrong message to Ohioans without a degree working just as hard to make ends meet. J.D. Vance says something similar 
calling out, calling the bailout, uh, calling it a bailout for those least in need. Joe Ingalls, this really is a is a tricky political issue, but it does affect a lot of Ohioans. It does affect a lot of Ohioans, and I'll tell you, it affects a lot of the younger voters who haven't particularly been engaged. So there's a new voting population for you right there. But I think the other thing, I, if you look at it, the problem is our, our the way that we finance student aid in this country in our schools anymore. It, it's gotten out of hand in a lot of cases, and a lot of these students are coming out with huge debts, and if you look at the, the who has that debt, they're more likely to be first-time college goers. They're more likely to be uh, minorities. And people who maybe didn't have well-heeled healed parents who had savings to help them go through. So, I, I, you know, the thing that this is helping, you know, people who don't need it. Um, I spoke with a, a girl who said that uh, she often found herself in the situation of choosing between paying the rent and eating or making her student loan payment. So there are people out there who truly this is a, a, a big thing for them. Would Republicans oppose this for the most part, Bob? Would they have agreed to this had it included provisions to try to fix the system, to try to rein in college tuition, to try to stop predatory college loan lenders? I think they would have thought better of it. I think they also would have thought better of it if it was finance somehow, which this isn't. I think those are the two big problems. And I think that's a valid point. The, you know, this forgives the, the loans or parts of the loans, some people all of their loans, but it does nothing to stop the rise in cost of college. And the president kind of mentioned it and addressed it, but does nothing about it. And I'm sure Tim Ryan's campaign pulled this, this whole issue, because it's been percolating for a while. I'm sure the, the numbers came back in such a way that he had to say, what he had to say. Now, the only problem with what he said is it completely goes against what he said, you know, previously, like two years ago about a college forgiveness, uh, loan forgiveness program. So yeah, he, he said he, the loan forgiveness was one thing, but he also wanted to make sure that folks who didn't go to college got a similar benefit somehow or, or make sure they were in the equation. $20,000 or $10,000, depending on the income level, what type of loan you had, Derek, that's what Biden has proposed. Others wanted Complete forgiveness. Others wanted fifty thousand, a hundred thousand. Was this a good compromise? I think it was a good compromise. And you know, Ohio ranks second in the nation in terms of who uh, or the percentage of student loans. I think the average is right around thirty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So it's a good thing. But politically, I don't know what it gets the president. To be quite honest, I mean, you get those folks that say, "Okay, taxpayers had to bail them out, bail, bail these students yeah. out." And the folks that got for their loans forgiven, they they remember it. But how does that translate into votes? How does that translate into uh, approval rating numbers going up? Who, who knows? If Biden was on the ballot, you could see how this might help him in November. But are those as a 25 year old who just got her loan forgiven going to come out and vote or is he going to come out and vote? for their congressperson or their well, senator? I, I think they'd have a reason to. Yeah. I mean, this does give them a reason to go vote because this is, you know, so many times um, you get, uh, when, remember when everyone got the tax cuts and everything? Yeah. People didn't even realize they got them because yeah. it was so, you know, negligible in, in their lives. But this is a big deal for the people who got it. So I think they're going to remember that. If I'm a high school senior going to college next year, what do I get? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> if I'm a and person who just wrote the last check for my student loan in 2019, what do I get? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. But that's just it. I mean, if you're if you're a, a high school student and you're looking at this, are you going to think, oh, I'll take out a bunch of loans because eventually part, if not all of it's going to be forgiven. I mean, I don't know what kind of message our government is sending to young people about this. Is that a legitimate argument? Dirk? It. it it is legitimate. Now, now, somebody that paid his student loans back, mm -hmm. you know, I wish it was grandfathered. That's not the case. <laughs> but that's what it is, don't right? we all? But, right, I know, right? <laughs> but, you know, I don't know what type of message it sends. I think for the people that it's benefiting, it sends a great message. Listen, I went to school, the government did something for me, and so it's great. Moving down the road, I do think we need to, we need to figure out how to make uh, higher education more affordable for
for students moving forward. All right, let's get to our last topic. Tougher gun regulations are back before state lawmakers and a Republican is pushing them. State Senator Matt Dolan's bill would allow judges to take guns away from people undergoing court-ordered mental health treatment. It would expand background checks for buyers under the age of 21. It would also use federal COVID recovery money to pay for mental health treatment. Bob Clegg, this is a pretty modest proposal. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically advanced background checks for three years, 18 year olds, 19 year olds and 20 year olds. You have to be under a court ordered program to be have your gun taken away. Does this have a chance of passing in the Republican legislature? Maybe, maybe it does. I mean, I, I, I applaud Senator Dolan for trying to tackle the hardest part of all of this, which I've always said, it's the mental health aspect. And it's the one part that government seems to not want to deal with. And I understand why, because it's the toughest part. I mean, it's very easy to pass legislation to ban guns. It's, I mean, not, it's not easy, but I mean, it's easy to propose that because you have set, okay, these kinds of guns, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, the real crux of the matter in, in all these awful instances that we've had is the person involved is mentally ill. And we have to somehow try to handle that or try to deal with that. And I think Senator Dolan is taking a good first step. I'm not saying that's not the only step, but a good first step to try to deal with that issue. Still, it's really hard, even with this proposal, the so-called red flag provision in this proposal. I mean, it's there are all kinds of hurdles to overcome. It's not immediate. And that's what you're trying to prevent is a rash, instant decision to use a gun to harm yourself or harm somebody else. Sure. Well, thank God somebody on the GOP side is doing something around uh, gun legislation and, and responsible gun ownership. You know, the bottom line is we have a problem in this country with guns. And I think if you really did a poll, most people don't want to have, they don't want the right of their gun being taken away. But we, people want responsible gun ownership. And part of that is background checks, doing the types of things that Senator Dolan is doing. And in a state where we've had gun violence, major gun violence, like the Dayton shooting, and nothing has been done to, to remedy that. As a matter of fact, we've made it easier for people to carry guns and conceal them. Matt Dolan, after that Dayton shooting, Joe Ingalls, was the person who proposed. He actually carried Governor DeWine's right. Strong Ohio, which yeah. had modest but more strict regulations than this one has. Yes, exactly. And um, that went nowhere. And, you know, when Governor DeWine proposed that, he said, you know what, I think we've gone too far the other way being permissive with guns. And I I really want this to get a a strong look before I sign any more gun legislation. And then the following year, he signs more gun legislation into law. So the the will of the legislature so far has been toward uh, making guns more available and and um, not doing anything that would possibly infringe on, on the, you know, the right to have a gun. I don't know if this can get through. If it does, I, I'm sure Governor DeWine will want to uh, help take credit for it because these are some of his plans. Does this ever get on the ballot? We talk about abortion restrictions may get on the ballot at some point here in Ohio. Does gun regulation, gun control ever get on the ballot, do you think? I think it gets on... From the conservative perspective, I think it gets on if the state starts, if it looks like the state is starting to come in and regulate more and more. Mm-hmm. I could see gun, gun, gun rights people wanting to get something on the ballot to reestablish that. Yeah. But I, that's from that side of it. From the, gun regula- from the gun control side, Derek, any chance of an organization cropping up to put reasonable restrictions, so-called, on the ballot? It's a possibility. Um, you know, I don't know how much, I don't know what else what more we could do on the, the, the right side or, or the GOP side to make it easier for people to get guns in the state. Um, but there could be an, an initiative that's, that's pushed by some gun, gun, uh, yeah. gun rights groups. And your money would, it would, be a, it would be an odd campaign, be money on both sides, at least on one side, certainly like the gun lobby would have plenty of, plenty of cash. Oh, Joe. the gun lobby, is, and I think the other side would have plenty of cash. And, and, but the real question is, what does that really accomplish? If, if, if the voters say they want something and it goes into law, what does that really accomplish? We just, walk, we just went through redistricting, where there was a redistricting proposal that it wasn't followed. 
Well, and that's how the that's amendment's a, written, I guess. Yeah, well, not the way it was written, and, <laughs> yeah. and that's in law. So right. does that really yeah. accomplish anything if you have a gun law that voters approve? And we'll see. I, it'll be a long way off. Anyway, <laughs> our final off-the-record parting shots. Bob Clegg, we'll start with you. Uh, Gallup uh, organization did their annual poll about quality of life. It showed almost 50% of, of Americans are either struggling or suffering in their lives. And that explains why the wrong track, right track here in the United States is over 70, 70% wrong track. All right, Derek. CHIPS Act has been signed. Uh, President Biden will be in town September 9th for the groundbreaking for a project that's gonna transform not only Central Ohio, but the state of Ohio. All right. Joe Ingalls. Backers of charter schools this week, they put up billboards and they were doing uh, ads to try to recruit people to come into those schools because of the Columbus teacher strike. Um, I don't know how many went and I'd love to know that. And, but I also think that this is, we're gonna see more of this. Every time the public schools fail on something, I think we're gonna see those charter schools come out and say, hey, I told you so, get in here. All right, uh, next week on Columbus on the Record, it'll be a Columbus on the Record special. It'll be my conversation with author and columnist Michael Tomoski. He has written a book, can, If You Can Keep It, about the struggling democracy and the long, long history of American polarization. So check it out next week at this time on Columbus on the Record. That will do it for this week's show. Please continue the conversation on Facebook. You can watch each episode anytime on your time at WOSU.org or through the PBS video app. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week. <laughs>